Welcome to Earth Revolution 2013. We are still the home of the green scene here in Nashville, Tennessee, and I'm your host, Susan Shan. Uh, this is part two of a visit with Susanna Lean. Susanna is a permaculture farmer who has a farm in Berea, Kentucky, Salamander Springs, where she produces market crops like corn and beans and other things. And she teaches a lot about permaculture. This particular footage is taken from a food summit here in Nashville in December of 2012, where she held a workshop. And uh, in this episode, she'll be talking about everything from soil analysis to crop rotation, uh, how to design a solar dryer for drying herbs and fruits and vegetables, and many other things. If you saw part one, you already know that Susanna is a wealth of information. So without further ado, here she is. I'm not gonna get into the science of what cash and exchange capacity means. Some of you probably know and can explain it much better than me. But in general, it's the ability of the soil to hold nutrients and not leach out. Stability of a nutrient, like phosphorus is a good example. You've got a long-term supply and you've got the short-term, you know, people applying the fertilizer that just leaches out if the plant root can't take it up. It's like pouring what Gatorade over you and seeing what you can catch in your mouth I don't know but <laughs> that's probably a bad example so cash and exchange capacity is something that dramatically can change now you're not going to get these kind of tests with an extension service test this is gonna this is something you have to pay for and it's worth it for me to pay for every once in a while um, so I wanted this I want Kayla are you in here would you come and read this, please? <laughs> this is a couple of apprentices from this summer. One of the apprentices wrote it, and it's just really cute. Okay, humus loam and silty clay live side by side, just a few yards between them. But they were of different classes and colors. Humus was rich and well fed, silty clay was crushed and poor. I lost everything to the machine, said silty to humus. Can you spare me just a little food? We had the same parents, you know. Yes, said Humus, for I have been richly blessed. I was once naked, but they clothed me, starving, and they fed me. So Humus sent out to, to his mycorrhiza and protozoa to feed Silky, and Silky grew darker, richer, and healthier. He was no longer thirsty or hungry. Silky began sharing Humus' gift with other poor soils nearby. Time passed and no machines returned to destroy the multiplying wells until finally the entire soil community lived happily ever after. Aww. So that's my wish for <laughs> May we stop tilling <laughs> the machines. That just kind of sums up soil fertility. Thank you, Kayla. So let's talk about cropping, intensive cropping. Uh, I got that. Well, actually, I've done it. You can do it directly through them. But Peaceful Valley Farm Supply in Colorado had a, uh, has had, um, you know, an offer. They do it with, ed it, it's nice to get it through them your first time because they give you a really ed educational booklet that helps you, if you're not a scientist, understand the things that I was, the very, even more than I tried to convey to you. But this Western Agricultural Laboratories is in a lot of places. They're not just in California. They've got offices in a lot of places. But Peaceful Valley Farm Supply is an organic farm supply that actually works through them, or works with them. I'm confused about one thing. You, when you started out, you had your clay soil, and then you put cardboard on top of it, and then you put pumice on top of it. And then when you plant the plants, you don't cut into the cardboard to go down into the clay soil. When I talked, to, was it clear to everybody else that you wait three months for that manure to compost before you plant? I may not have said that, but her question is about, I guess, you know, having to go through cardboard because the cardboard by three months later is broken down. Yeah, so for me, I say three months, but I usually do it in the fall and wait till the spring. So the next year, you, had, you don't even know there was cardboard there, of course, because it composted like everything else. Why wouldn't you put cardboard on top of the home? I mean, 
Um, I guess there'd be a lot of reasons. It wouldn't break down. It would blow away. Um, it would, I mean, you'd block rain entering. I don't know. I mean, the cardboard is a plate that covers, the purpose of the cardboard is to not break down so quickly, which is why you'd need a lot of newspapers to do the same job, that that sod layer or whatever you've got, if it underneath does have the chance to break down and become compost as well. So it shoot, doesn't shoot through weeds. So, okay. Um, is, it not, is it not a concern that cardboard has formaldehyde in it? I am not a scientist. I think we need to have this argument. Some, uh, yeah. I, I do not have a problem with it. And I, what I have the most problem with is the waste stream that nobody deals with so that is but my solution and it's you know it's like everybody has to make their own decision on how they want to deal with our responsibility for waste that happens if we say goodbye to it if we have trash and we just say, think it'll go somewhere into a landfill and we don't take responsibility for part of it then I mean whether it has formaldehyde for us and we're not going to have our plants do that job of doing the breaking down of it you know, somebody, it's got to go somewhere. So we have to try to make our own personal decisions on what it, and one thing I will say is that um, this is for the very beginning. And the, and some people, like, they might let a bed go, and one year they might have to do cardboard again because they, they didn't get it mulched, but it's to start. And if you don't want to do it and you really think tilling and using petroleum is better, then, then go ahead and till, but never till again. Just keep it mulched. But it, a one-time thing for me, it was, you know, and of course, like I said in the slide, plain cardboard, take the stickers off. You know, you could use a huge layer of newspapers if you think the soy-based ink is safe, you know, but it's your decision. Better get a wool carpet. What's that? Well, I read wool, like wool carpets. Yeah. Have any. Yeah. Good. Yeah. It's hard to find anything safe these days, <laughs> to be honest. So I talked about how productivity per acre can be a lot higher. And that's not just true in a bean field where there's no rows. It's true in the conventional onion cultivation is a good example. So I use that since onions are a big crop for me. It's usually double rows with a, s a small, I don't know how many people are familiar with seeing conventional, but they have two double rows and a small space and double rows out in fields, basically, of onions. So an acre of onions, you can easily calculate what that is, even if they do them six inches apart. So the way these are planted, I think, is probably best shown on the next slide. But to show you how you can have four times the production, I also included this, whereas this was taken the same day. It's not a great picture, but these two pictures at the bottom were taken the same day. Harvesting the onions, we may even leave a few in the ground because they're, they're not died back at the top yet, you know. But right away, they're planted with another crop because we put in every month, we put in cucumbers and, and uh, zucchini, summer squash to keep on the market. So that bed is being used uh, continuously. But the way onions have worked, and in fact, I think this slide up at the top shows some onions six inches, about six inches apart, but that's what they are for bulbs, for the dry onions. But I do sell a lot of scallions, so there's a lot of onions that are planted double that, like three inches apart, because the scallion comes out in, in May, and uh, actually even in the end of April, and is sold. So then the rest are left for bulb onions. So your productivity is double in that. So you can see in the center slide uh, one bed of onions as it's growing. And then this is a, similar to the slide before where I said that sometimes, you know, when you're harvesting dry onions, you wait for the, it to fall over and dry up at the neck. And sometimes they all, all aren't doing it at the same time. But the reason I use the example of summer squash and cucumbers is it's a wonderful rotation for me because the cucumber beetle can be a real bear, um, a squash. It, and the sulfur smell of the onions, you know, I always use the Rime fabric for the early crop, but 
after June, you know, the next crop that comes in to get put them on a bed that has a lot of smelly onion tops seems to really help. So I don't know, you know, the science of that or why, but that just happens to be my rotation. It works really well with my crop rotation on the beds because um, one year, that cycle is separate from what I call the solanacea cycle, which is colored red on my rotation my maps because I don't want tomato blight. So I make sure that those beds don't get tomatoes. Or you. So this rotation includes alliums. I mean, onions and garlic, I considered the same thing. Alliums is that family, for those of you who are wondering. Um, and, and the squash family, and actually, I, there's another one that I group on. I don't have a copy of my rotation map, but it, it's not like I'm rotating every family because there's some families that have no issues, for me anyway, and some families I definitely want to rotate, and sometimes I, I don't rotate. Um, you know, like there's alliums I do. There's like lettuces and the broccoli and all those families. There's really very little issue, and they're so spread out for me that I don't worry about them. But anyway, um, so right away that in that same season, this is a 12 month season, it has cucumbers and summer squash covering the bed. That's when they're young down there in number four. But through September until the frost comes, that's what the bed has, whatever it is that you are producing or want, you know, but that whole family of cucumber, summer squash, uh, zucchini is a good one for me. And so in October, or even into November, I mean, I've planted uh, salad greens in November just this year. In um, last year, we could have planted them in January. But, you know, you want to get some plants started before the soil really cools off that you can get them covered up with low tunnels. And there's me sweeping off snow in the middle of the winter. Um, I was going to talk, actually I should have had it right after here, the winter crops tunnels. Let me go to that. And the, yeah. That's what I was just going to talk about. Yeah. My low tunnels are nothing spectacular. This is winter crops on a low bu budget. I've got two things here. This is uh, something I still use. I've got um, these that you see in here were scrap, started off because I had a lot of scrap PVC, another dumpster diving thing, but there's a lot of ways you can do that, but I still use it under what I've built of low tunnels, the um, hoop houses, I've got the hoop house I'll show you on the next page is out of, you know, obviously the metal, high tunnels, they call, you can walk under them, but low tunnels are for me, the tunnel here I made out of what I call CTS pipe. I used it for my water line when I brought it down from the spring box. It's, uh, CTS actually means copper tube siding, but it's, it's a size, copper tube size? I don't know why it's called CTS, but it's water line pipe. You get it in big rolls, and I had some that was getting a cracking in it. It was extra from putting it in my water line. So it's basically just a structure Kayla, you helped me build that. You want to talk about it? <laughs> um, I have got to measure all the CTS out. It's kind of pretty difficult with all the circles and stuff. But anyway, um, yeah, it was a fun time. We just built a frame around it. You need a frame support across the top to stabilize it and something to put it into. Like, it's just pipe and hollow, so we um, actually just... You could use rebar if you want right in the ground, but I actually have scrap wood that I put screws on that it could just pop into. So there's a lot of ways to do it, which is basically just stabilized, flexible pipe. It's not too flexible, but more flexible than the, the PVC pipe that's underneath. And you saw that on the what I called low tunnels here when she was asking what low tunnels are. There's another way to do it. It's like Legos, you know, you can make it whatever size, whatever width you want, and you need uh, T's and elbows, and so if you, that can be a cost. PVC is cheap, and whether you want PVC in your garden, that's another thing, you know. But it was something that I had, and um, I like, in some cases, like with the salad, not with broccoli or parsnips or those, even carrots can get tall, but 
I like to have the flexibility and like, for example, to be able to put hay bales on the north side. Um, there's advantages and disadvantages of all of it and it, I don't recommend any one thing. I want the idea to be that you get about recycling resources and using what you have. The another thing, this was uh, several years ago and I haven't found them in the dumpsters lately, but the bubble wrap, big sheets of bubble wrap plaster in uh, furniture dumpsters, that's actually, I mean, it's not UV resistant, so you don't want to leave it out there. Of course, it's only in the winter when the sun's not intense, but you might not be able to use it more in a couple seasons, but better it goes out of the landfill for a while and gets repurposed. So it was nice because it gave extra insulation. You can't tell with the snow over it, but I can tell. This was she big sheets of bubble wrap that I guess they had around couches or whatever at the furniture store. I'm going to go back because I've realized that that was kind of or, out of order. So the fruit orchard is a simplification of something I'm going to maybe get into if we have time. And it's something that's talked a lot about when people talk about permaculture is the food forest. And they have, you know, all these plants working together. If you're Harvesting for market, it may not be always. I love my food forest, but it's stuff for us. It's not like for market. I, I don't. I can't really like. I have strawberries in my orchard, and so when I say it's a simplification, strawberry wild strawberry is one of those ground covers in that you find in the forest. And when we talk about the food forest and imitating all the, it's basically communities of plants that work together. So we can utilize that, even if we don't have a full-blown foods forest and we're trying to be a market gardener, we can still utilize that idea of like, well, okay, the ground cover of strawberries. Yeah, strawberries make fruit before the leaves on the apple trees really block the sun, and it works pretty well. So basically, if you look at the, the top slide and the middle slide, which is really kind of um, blurry and old, uh, the top slide's in the wind. The top left slide is in, in the winter, and I put down a lot of sawdust or wood shavings. And there's you can see up close the strawberries, but the strawberries um, are ground cover in between. These are semi dwarf trees, so they're like in the in between part in that bed. And then in the summer, the comfrey comes out. How many of you know comfrey? You know that it's a really amazing healer. I use comfrey for a salve uh, that I sell, but comfrey in this situation has many, many purposes. Um, and one of those is being a barrier to the invasion of the grasses and the briars and stuff out that I don't want to compete with the root zone of the apple trees because the apple trees are very surface rooted. And so grass is terrible competition for fruit trees, especially apples and pears. Um, and that's why a lot of people have issues. Did you? <laughs> that's a whole nother subject. <laughs> I think the only way to have, I've found to get rid of Bermuda is to cover it with something really like carpet or something for a year and make sure you go three feet beyond it. We'll get it. Um, so Comfrey salve is in these jars down in the right. Um, we dry it on the solar dryer, which I'm going to talk about next. These are the roots of comfrey. And comfrey is one of those plants that if you till, it's a weed. And, it, and dandelion's not a weed to me either. Dandelion would be, to me, like comfrey. And burdock, even though it's kind of got burrs on it, they are in daikon radish, which we'll talk about in the staple crops uh, as a cover crop. It's out on my field this, in the winter. They're all deep rooted. They go down like, and they break up that hard pan. They access nutrients that, that obviously, especially the apple trees can't access. And it's producing all of this wonderful nutrient rich biomass. Comfrey is especially good. It is the root that I use in the salve, partly because 
I mean, the, the plant, all of the plant is rich in allotoin, which is a cell regenerant. And if you get wounds like I do all the time, you don't want to be without comfrey. I was making it for myself, and then I started making it in film canisters, and now those are non-existent, so I had to break down and get the amber jars and get professional about it. But it is amazing stuff. But the whole plant has allotoin. It's rich, but the, it kind of makes your salve kind of green. Um, so the, the root is easy to dry. You can separate out the water from the oil. And, and I use a, now I use shea butter because it's great. With coconut oil, it was really hard to get the, the beeswax. Actually, um, Roberta is, is actually grating beeswax down here. And the beeswax, you would make it like lip balm or it'd be not enough beeswax and it'd get too hot in the summer at the farmer's market. So shea butter is just about right. Just a little bit of beeswax and that's all you need because shea butter has a very high melting temperature and it's also really good for your skin as well. So I don't need to get off on that too much, but comfrey just to me is the per perfect permaculture plant. And that's why I listed um, all the many uses of comfrey. And when I yeah, I said, I mentioned earlier that we were going to talk about the principles. The principle number four, I haven't really said anything about. I, the first two are very important, but the, on your handout, principle number four is about integrating. You know, the zones I, I mentioned in the beginning were important, but how do you integrate things? Well, let's make it like everything that you need on your farm, make it be filled by many things. And every element fulfill many functions. And so here's comfrey and it fulfills many functions. It can be even be forage for animals. But all of the things that I've listed up here in the function that I'm asking it to be in the orchard, plus it's a healing salve, important medicine, uh, a wonderful addition to compost. Say you're just growing it. Like Jeremy with National Foodscapes, if you haven't talked to him yet, you know, he'll He'll start it for you, and, and um, he makes a lot of compost for his business. And so that, you know, you can just have comfrey for that reason. Just have it to make your own medicine. You don't have to have an orchard to have comfrey. It just happened to be my situation that I wanted it to fulfill many, many uses. And so in my case, like, the barrier to invasion of grass was important, but it may not be for you, but every situation is different. So. Does the comfrey itself not encroach in, in, in the tree? No, that's the thing is when I say it's a weed in a cultivated situation, thanks for reminding me, you want to slash it down a few times a year anyway, but that's the biomass you're producing because if it goes to flower, it can seed. But the other thing he is asking about invading like by, by pieces of the root, one little piece of the root it's like horseradish. If any of you have grown horseradish, you know, it can, you know, easily sprout off of just a chunk of root. So if you go in there and cultivate, yeah, it can spread. But if you keep it contained and you don't till, it has stayed, you know, in my uh, perimeter. I so of, I'm trying to do a little food forest too. I got like 20 fruit trees in the yard and I'm, I just planted a bunch of butt, uh, wild berry bushes and stuff. But I still have grass. I'm still mowing because it's my front yard and I live in like yeah. a suburban neighborhood. But I'm trying to... Just trying to make an edge to, with it. It's, it's yeah, just to it. keep it away yeah. from... Yeah. Like you might do like trails or something and then use, use that for an edge for that too or something like that. That might work. Yeah, the thing is that you can take comfrey, a piece of it every year. I started with a few plants and if you look at the... Um, yeah, well, this is just one bed you see in the picture. Um, you know, there's Asian pears and apples and... and it's around all of them now and it, you know just every year taking the cleanest chunks the cl the ones that are easier to clean and chop up and dry on the solar dryer which is that we're going to talk about are the ones that i save and the, the crotchety ones are the ones i put in the ground where i want them i just put them in the ground just a little piece here and there you know wherever it's very easy to grow com comfrey and so it's considered a weed <laughs> it's a good one so the solar dryer, how many of you have a solar dryer? Nobody. Um, I just really, I've used my solar dryer for a lot, lot more and more and more and more things over time. And like I, I can less tomatoes now and I dry sun dry more tomatoes. 
I have jujube dates, which I dry, and figs, um, chilies. But I started, you know, I dry herbs, like the dried herbs we have over in the booth. And um, some herbs don't, like mints, they'll just dry if you leave them set on the counter. They're very water-based. But basil and oregano, they have a, a essential oils. And so they need to be zapped or they'll kind of turn brownish quick. Um, what else? Mushrooms, I actually... Sometimes we get so many mushrooms from the woods that we, we can't fit them all in the solar dryer. But I dry a lot of things in there. And, you know, when I give you these times, like how long it takes, that's just so, you know, you can't because you may have three cloudy days. You just, you want to get them out there so they get zapped on a sunny day. And you just take, I have a judgment and of when it can come off. Um, and... I think experience is the best, you know, I can't really say, okay, do it this, there's no formulas, you have to, every, everybody's situation is different, but I will say that whatever uh, size you end up making your, your solar dryer, the ratio of the trays to your capturing of your sun, and that always has to face the, face the sun, so you, I've got wheels on it, which you can't see very well, but they're just like lawnmower wheels. But that's like a shower door on it, and it's black inside. So it's like a solar collector, and it's big, and you see how small, well, you can't see, yeah, you see the trays? It's like, boy, it's tempting to want to have big trays. Man, I went and made and built that, but you're not going to get that chimney effect. You want hot air, cool air going in the bottom, hot heating up and flowing. That's what a chimney effect does, and so it dries it out quickly. And if you suddenly get big trays, they can't do it. And so it won't dry, and you get moldy stuff. So you really got to make sure it's like, shh. So I could go a little taller, because I actually am tall enough that I could build it up a little higher, but I don't want to go wider. Oh, another thing to say is that it's good to close it up at night. Um, she was talking about it, 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 it couldn't it get moldy. You know how when your temperature goes way down and you get uh, moisture in the air? So you want to close, see the vents that I have on the top? You close the top and the bottom. It is really amazing how well it works, I, um, how you do a lot of different things. Would that be online? I think there probably is, but not mine. I haven't put mine on. I've seen some bad plans online, but I don't get online that much. So just, I think, keep in mind that ratio I was telling you about when you look at, 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 at possible plans, that whole idea of heating up in a chimney. Well, that's all for now. I hope you enjoyed our visit with Susanna Lean. Until next time, I'm your host, Susan Shan, for the show Earth Revolution. Peace, love and permaculture. We'll see you again.